we ran from two planes to a hundred. Um, in our first year, we carried 200,000 passengers, and this year, 10 years on, we will carry 33 million passengers. It's really simple innovation and simple things that I'll talk about, mostly around our people and some of the things that we did in uh, growing the airline. And then whatever questions you have afterwards, just fire away. That was the first day. Actually, I came from the music business. Uh, I had no experience in the airline business. That's probably why we have succeeded. Um, I did uh, 14 years making records. My last record was in Germany with uh, an artist called Western Hagen, uh, similar to Tom, a German cowboy. Uh, most interesting in Hamburg, you see a German singing country and Western music. Uh, it was quite interesting. And I had the idea, I was in um, AOL Time Warner. It started as Warner Communications, it became Time Warner, and the final merger, which was one merger too many for me, was AOL uh, Time Warner. And it's funny how you make a career. I was sitting there in July of 2001, and the owner of uh, Time Warner, Steve of AOL, was talking about his vision for AOL. And I was listening to this and saying, please give me some of the drugs you are taking because it just sounded like fairy tale stuff. And um, I left based on one statement. The uh, owner, Steve Case, said to me, Tony, what do you reckon our stock price should be in a year's time? And the stock price back in 2001 of AOL Time Warner was $80. And I thought to myself, based on what I've heard, and Time Warner was the company that came up with EBITDA, earnings before everything you don't like. Uh, and then call it cash flow. <laughs> I forget about the eight billion of debt there. And he said, what do you reckon our stock price should be? And the stock price was $80 at the time. And I thought, having listened to what you said, if it's $80 in a year's time, you've done well. But I knew that I'd get instantly dismissed, so I said $90. And he went, wrong boy, $500. And at that point, I said, please give me the drugs you are taking. I walked out of the room. I sold my stock options. Not very many of them, but I sold them at $78. And I went to my boss and I said, I quit because I think this company is going to be destroyed and I don't want to take your salary and be a part of it. He was thrilled because he always wanted to get rid of me uh, because he thought I was after his job, which I was. And uh, before he could change his mind, before he thought I could change his mind, he gave me a payoff and I left. And I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, music was my life. And I was flying back from uh, New York and I stopped in London and I was in a bar having a soft Coca-Cola and I saw Stelios on TV, another Airbus customer that John loves slightly more than me. <laughs> but maybe afterwards he'll love me more. <laughs> and uh, Stelios was talking about low-cost airlines and he was fighting British Airways. And all. I thought, well, this looks interesting. So I went to Luton Airport, an airport that I'd never been to. And so everything was orange and people were flying to Barcelona for nine pounds, France for seven pounds. And at that point, I decided I was going to start an airline. Now there's a very fine line between brilliance and stupidity. Okay, And I knew nothing about the airline business, but I just thought, this is a great idea. And this is before I met John. If I had met John, then I probably wouldn't have started the airline business. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I thought, well, this is great. If I can bring this to Asia, this would be unbelievable. And you know, I knew nothing about airlines. I, think I had, between me and my partner, who's gone shopping, uh, we had about $250,000 to start this airline. So I go back to Malaysia, and uh, we <laughs> went on the internet, we were building this model, and my first, I was an accountant by training actually. And in the time that I had qualified as an accountant, till 2001, Microsoft had taken over the world. So I was used to using Lotus spreadsheets and Windows came in. So my first investment was hiring an accountant 
to build a financial model. So we built this model and um, it looked very good and we roped in two more of our partners. And we sat there one day and it all looked very good and suddenly Cameroon said to me, so how do you get an airline license? And we all looked at each other. Mm. It's not like you can go to car for and buy one. Uh, and then, to cut a long story short, we saw the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Uh, he loved the idea. I remember him saying to me, you will succeed because you're so passionate and you're not from the airline business. You have my blessing. And uh, then the but came in, but you have to go and buy an airline. So we came out of there like, how are we going to buy an airline? We have $250,000. But I was, I'm a very optimistic person. I said, there must be an airline for sale. So we found two airlines in Malaysia, <coughs> one called Palangi Air. We went to see them, and you had to be God or pretty close to God to turn around that airline. I had never seen a balance sheet like that in my life. So we walked away from that. And then there was Air Asia, which was owned by a Malaysian conglomerate. We went to see them and said, we want to buy Air Asia. And they said, you can have it tomorrow. Uh, and they said, how much will you pay us? And I cheekily said, 25 cents, one Malaysian ringgit. And they said, you can still have it tomorrow. And I thought, damn, I should have said, pay me to take away this airline. Uh, and that was it. They were great guys. So armed with $250,000, on September the 8th, 2001, we signed to buy AirAsia. Uh, subject to due diligence. We said subject to due diligence because we and Cameroon were remortgaging our house uh, to pay for the insurance, which was due in uh, December. Three days later, 9-11 happened. And welcome to the airline business. <laughs> and it's been like that ever since. But, uh, and I told my partner, people still have to fly from KL to Penang, from KL to Singapore, so you know, let's go ahead with this. And it helped us in some ways because lease prices collapsed. We were initially going to start with 737-200s. And uh, we were able to afford the 300s. And December the 8th, 2001, we took over AirAsia with 254 terrified staff. One of them is still here, our chief pilot, who went to some crazy airline in, in the Gulf called Qatar Air. <laughs> and then realized what a beautiful place he left and came back. Uh, so uh, we forgive them for a period. After a while we say rot in Qatar. So, <laughs> so we, we, we can't write all of this by the way. So my friend, Akbar is my friend, as is Louis' friend. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Airbus are now worried about inviting me for this speech. <laughs> it's only five minutes and they're sweating already. <laughs> so, um, where was I? Yeah, December the 8th, we took over two 737s. And that was the first day we, uh, me and Kamarudin, uh, armed with, remember, $250,000, two planes, 254 staff. And, um, that was the old AirAsia. That's what it looked like. Uh, all airlines seem to have some animal related to it. Tiger, lion, birds. And in Malaysia, we have one named after an insect, firefly. And, um, you know, our, our first thing, not a good choice of a name, because in, that firefly is the shortest living insect. So, <laughs> So going back, no, this is an innovation, this is not a comedy show. Um, but the first thing we did, and it was a very simple thing, and this is the first innovative thing we did. I looked at the plane, we had no money, it was blue and green, it had a bird, which I thought was facing the wrong way, and uh, we changed it to red. So, look at the difference, not just the girls. Um, <laughs> And look at that wonderful plane versus the 737. You know, big difference. So we, we changed and uh, over the last 10 years, we've gone from 200,000 passengers to 32 million a year, from 254 staff to now we have 9,000 staff in airlines in, um, <coughs> in Thailand, Indonesia, 
Malaysia, Philippines, and very soon in Japan, which is something I'm extremely proud about uh, all in these 10 years. We used a very innovative route structure. We flew to places that no one ever flew before. 50% uh, of our routes are routes that no one ever did before. So you can be innovative in the airline business with the right aircraft and the right support. You know, provided with the Airbus 320, we could go to virtually any airfield around. And we developed so many new routes. Uh, we flew to places like Macau before anyone else flew to Macau. Uh, I remember we did cheeky advertising because we said, at least you have a low fare to take you home when you lose all your money um, in the casinos. And you know, we went from one flight a day to Macau to now we have 22 flights a day. We have more flights than Air Macau actually into Macau. Uh, and I think that's been the, been the trend, trend. We have always had problems. And having good partners like Air, uh, Airbus have helped us tremendously. Through our growth, we've been through SARS, bird flu, tsunami, earthquakes, government, national carriers, high oil, low oil, credit crisis. You name it, we've had it, but we've always found a way to grow. And really through new routes and marketing. And we were never defeated. During SARS, no one wanted to fly. They all said, if you go on a plane, you'll die. But I knew Malaysians very well. If you put a fare low enough, they will risk their lives. <laughs> okay? 800 ringgit, oh no, SARS. 80 ringgit, who cares about SARS? And we. We did fill the plane, but we made enough money to cover our costs, and we grew. During the Bali bomb, the next day, no one wanted to fly to Bali. I told my marketing staff, we can't let the Balinese down. This is the time they need us the most, and we made a lot of money out of flying to Bali, so we will not cancel the flight. So we came up with Love Bali campaign, and we gave away uh, 10,000 free seats to Bali. And again, Malaysians and Thais and Indonesians didn't let me down. Give a free seat, and they weren't scared of terrorists either. <laughs> uh, but the, the key about the free seat was it was innovative marketing, because for every Asian that goes and gets a free deal, they will tell a 1,000 people about it. So we effectively, the cost of those 10,000 free seats was more than covered through the word of mouth when people went to Bali and came back and said, no problem. And we were honored by the Balinese government. We were the only airline never to cancel a flight to Bali. We went to Aceh after the tsunami. We were the first and only airline, international airline, flying to Aceh. Because we said the people need connectivity, so we, we carried it through. So we've always found ways. We've always looked at, at a crisis as a way to actually grow market share and find opportunities to help. There are always opportunities there. And in fact, our orders were done during some of the bleakest, bleakest periods in the economy. It's also a good time to buy planes, by the way. Uh, so we've always been able to, to find the market. And that's our, our growth trajectory. The flight hasn't come out, but you know, last year we carried 29, 32, including AirAsia X. We've carried um, 100 million passengers. The slide hasn't come out, but we're the fastest growing LCC if you compare Ryanair and Southwest, which is on the far right graph. That's their growth trajectory. With the extra 275 planes, we believe that we could be one of the largest airlines in the world and definitely one of the largest LCCs in the world. We are in a good part of the world in terms of Asia, but you still have to deliver that. That's uh, our aircraft size today uh, with the 100th delivery. And as John's mentioned, we have um, another 275 to come. And we've won the world's best low-cost airline three years running. And a lot of a lot, large part of that is the fantastic reliability. We work the aircraft very hard. We're doing almost 14 hours a day, uh, eight landings and takeoffs. We start at six, we finish at uh, 12 at night, and 25 minute turns all along. And the aircraft have been great. Where they haven't been robust, Airbus have been fantastic with uh, CFM in ensuring our reliability is and we have one of the best reliabilities and performances in the industry. So how did we do it? You know, how did we go from the investment of 250,000 to today our market capitalization is 3 billion. On uh, Friday we list High Air Asia, 
which was our first joint venture we did for about one and one point one billion dollars um, in what is probably the toughest period for any airline. Uh, we announced our results last quarter and uh, we grew by 7%. We announced it yesterday, the day before yesterday. So it's all these things in the jigsaw puzzle and it's a lot of innovation, but it's not innovation as how you think of innovation. It's how we deal with people, how we deal with pilots who are a unique group of people, um, how we make pilots like engineers. If you have a very classic case here, generally most airlines you don't see this. My chief pilot is sitting next to our engineer. Generally they hate each other. Um, but we worked hard so that they, they like each other much more. In fact, I was so maniacal about it, I made the chief pilot carry the photograph of the chief engineer and vice versa. And I made them sit next to each other. Because if pilots and engineers don't get on, it costs me a lot of money. Um, but I won't go into that today. So it's really, a lot of this presentation is people. We have 9,000 staff, we have no unions, we have one big family, we're pretty flat structured, uh, don't really have titles, we all have desks, and you know, it's pretty unilateral. Really I've dressed up today for Tom and uh, John and Louis, generally with a t-shirt and jeans with a little bit of a stomach, and I'm wandering around the airport, and most of the airport security guys think I'm an illegal immigrant. Um, <laughs> that's just jumped off a plane. But I'll take that, because sometimes when you wear a suit, and this is innovation, right? In, in Asia, it generally doesn't happen. The CEO's got a big office, he wears a boss suit. Uh, I'm in France, okay, Louis Vuitton suit. And, uh, oh no, but it's a Franco-German company, boss and Louis Vuitton suit. And uh, we uh, put a distance between us and our staff. But when you look worse than them, they have no problems talking to you. So we rather have 9,000 brains working for us than just 10. Many Asian companies, the top level decides everything and the rest are implementers. At AirAsia, I like to think we have 9,000 people uh, contributing to the success of the airline. Uh, we're very accessible, you know, I used to do a lot more, but once a month, I'm a cabin crew, once every two months, I carry bags, which is the hardest job in AirAsia because people who fly with us generally bring their house with them. <laughs> and uh, it ain't easy. <laughs> and uh, the thing I, I do least is actually check in because that is, that is the toughest job. It's important, and you'll see it throughout this presentation, because I don't think you can be an effective CEO unless you go to the ground. Um, and I'll give you one example. When we bought uh, Airbus, it's slightly taller than the 737. And we used to just throw the bags in, I mean, lovingly put the bags in, <laughs> um, kiss them, put them nicely. With the uh, Airbus, we couldn't quite do that. And so the boys came to me and said, we need belt loaders. And I said, no, 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 it's too expensive, right? It costs us about $2 million. So the next time I was carrying bags, they put me on the Indonesian flights. And on the Indonesian flights, people bring their house and their neighbor's house. Uh, so I almost broke my back in the process. And I said, you're right, I'm wrong. We go buy the uh, belt loaders and I probably saved a lot of bags in the process. Uh, so that is our, our strength, and I think a lot of innovation, people think of innovation as high tech, latest this, et cetera, but simple innovation things, like how you make your people work, innovation and management, I think sometimes people forget about the simple things, and that's what we've spent a lot, a lot of time on, to ensure that we have a happy company, and a company that works together as opposed to many silos. We'll talk about that. So, you know, we also have, are in multi-different countries, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and it's tough sometimes as a Southeast Asian brand, when you try and pose your culture on another, it's sometimes easier for a European and American coming into Southeast Asia with their brand. Um, McDonald's would have it easier than AirAsia going into another country and saying, this is how we do it. But I was really, really maniacal about it, that we would have one brand. You know, when I went to Thailand, um, the pilots refused to go in the same bus as the cabin crew. They said it was beneath them. In Malaysia, it's the other way around. The pilots refused to go in the bus unless the cabin crew were there. Uh, and I won't tell you what the Indonesians want. So, how did I solve this problem? I shipped up 20 Malaysian pilots to Thailand 
to show them, one of them was him, to show them on the benefits of going in the same bus together. And uh, net net, we had five Thai Malaysian marriages uh, <laughs> from, <laughs> from that. So we forced integration in many ways. So we have one brand. And if you look at all those girls there, they're from all, all countries in Southeast Asia, and you won't really know where they're from. And that's the power of our brand. And we work very, very hard to keep our brand together. And we've built many careers. This is really innovative, if you want to talk about innovation. Every company has massive talent pool. And the opportunity to grow is really within your talent pool. But we miss that. We miss all the polished diamonds in the company. So when I was first carrying bags, I saw we had a lot of bright kids who were really smart, but never had money for further education. So I offered these boys a chance, uh, and later girls, a chance to be a pilot. I said, I don't care whether you have no examinations, whether you have no O levels, or less school at 13 or whatever, we will help you. And our first uh, 18 cadets, 11 cadets, 18 cadets, 11 came from within the company. And we had boys who were check-in assistants, who carried bags for us, etc. And one of them, a check-in assistant, who was earning about $200, had the highest marks ever in Malaysian Flying Academy. And 18 months later, they became first officers. And I'm proud to say about five of them have already become captains. So you join to carry bags in the company, you join to check in. Two years later, you're flying a brand new Airbus. Five years later, you're a captain. So that's what I mean by innovation, making sure that you find every bit of talent in your organization. We wouldn't have been able to grow if we, didn't, if we weren't innovative in finding talent within our own company pool. And now we have cabin crew who are pilots, cabin crew who are engineers, uh, marketing guys who move to run countries. It's a very uh, buoyant company that anything is possible. And that's what my first message is. Innovation is, when you think of innovation, you think of a better engine or newer technology, but they're simple innovative things that many companies miss. And one is your whole talent pool and how you get the best out of your talent pool. And that's what we've been fairly good at. Here's a great story. When I started AirAsia, there were no female pilots. And I asked our chief pilot, I said, why don't we have women pilots? And he came up with the most ridiculous reason I ever heard in my life. So I said, if a woman can run a country, of which Tom and Louie are about to see one, uh, she can certainly fly a plane. So now we have 62 female pilots. And the other day was history. We had captain was female, co-pilot was female, all the cabin crew were female, and all the passengers were male. Uh, <laughs> now that last bit's not true. Uh, but we're very proud of that at AirAsia. And again, there's a huge talent pool that the Southeast Asian airline industry was just neglecting. And you know, we were, here's a wonderful example. This girl was a cabin crew in a bar when I was having a soft drink. She said to me, I want to be a pilot. And I said, go for it. And she qualified to be a pilot. And then she calls me up one day and says, uh, everyone says I'm very beautiful. Can I take part in Miss Thailand? interesting. And I said, okay, provided if you win, I get to use your photograph for the rest of your life for free. Uh, and um, she took part in Miss Thailand and she won Miss Thailand. She came fifth in Miss Universe. And now I think she's about to train the commander of, uh, be a captain of an A320. So the only airline in the world that has a Miss Thailand flying for them. Okay, beat that Singapore Airlines. Uh, <laughs> but the moral of the story is not the Miss Thailand. Is the fact that we had a flat structure that she could come up to me and say, this is my dream, I want to be a pilot, and we can do it. Now, if she was in another organization, dare I say another Asian airline, she probably wouldn't even know the CEO and, and she would have been a cabin crew for a long, long time. So that, our style, our culture, our innovation allows us to get the best out of people. And we, you know, we've built a very strong brand. We spend a lot 
uh, on branding. Uh, yeah, that ad is, I own a football club called Queen's Park Rangers, which just survived being relegated. <laughs> and uh, when we did the ad, we did this, and in, in Asia you don't do these things, but we do it. So we said the airline with balls. <laughs> and um, we've really been very aggressive in uh, advertising. We've really embraced the digital side. This is something I think we've been very innovative at. We have the largest uh, Facebook site of any airline. The site's a little bit out of date. We're almost four million users of Facebook. We believe we've interacted with our customer base so much. I'm on Twitter. I have 210,000 people follow me. And uh, we're very accessible. Problems, good, bad, whatever, uh, we, we deal with it. There was no internet in selling airline tickets when we started 10 years ago. Now 85% of our business. We didn't worry about whether there was infrastructure or not. We said if we put the fare right and the product is right, people will go to the internet. And uh, now we've, you know, we've gone in, uh, we're driving mobile. We're the number one travel website. So innovation is also having the courage to go out and do it. If I listened to everybody who said, no, you have to use GDS, no, you can't use the internet, we'd be the same as everyone else. But we just were stubborn and said, we'll do it, and we use marketing, and uh, the rest is history. And we've done a lot of product innovation, but I won't bore you with that. And sport sponsorship. And you know, whenever we, this is haunted me, because my clubs had the most people sent off. Uh, but I, I sponsored the referees, and it was really funny, right? We really push our brand dramatically. So I went to the Premier League, and it was me versus Emirates. And Emirates had like a gazillion dollars, and I had about 10. Uh, and so I made a big presentation to the Premier League. I said, look, you've got to support us. There's about two people in Dubai who watch football. <laughs> and in Malaysia, we've been watching football for a hundred years. Plus, we've been fixing all your games. Uh, all the bookies come from Malaysia. <laughs> and so the Premier League were in love. And, and finally, I think I got it because I said, I want to sponsor the red card. And they looked at me and said, what do you mean? Uh, I said, when you send a player off, I want to...